at the objective truths that shape our understanding of the universe. The interesting thing about an objective truth is that it's true no matter what. Imagine that. Here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Today's topic, millennium. What does uh, millennium, however, it's not even written as such in the Word of God. But what is it? What does the word mean? Well, it's made up of two words. It's made up of mil, which is um, thousand, and then the um, then um, a, a year. It means a thousand years. Simple period. And um, therefore, it is a period of time that inasmuch as it is one specific 1,000 year period set aside and documented in God's Word as we're going to go to here in a moment. But also, Peter in the third chapter of his second writing, Second Peter, would say, I don't want you to be ignorant about this one thing, that a thousand years is to the Lord is one day. So, what is the Lord's day? Everybody looks forward to the Lord's day. It's a, that thousand year period, known as by most people or many people as the millennium. And what, when does it transpire? Well, it happens just immediately. As a matter of fact, there's, I feel there is no difference between the last day of this dispensation and the first day of the millennium because it all transpires at the second advent, at the seventh trump. It all happens instantly at that time. And then Christ returns to this earth and we're going to have a kingdom at that time. Our last subject, we're going to have a king and bless your hearts, he's going to rule. So uh, let's just kind of check out the word of God and many times the millennium is mentioned more than is brought to our attention. Let's ask a word of wisdom, if we may, from our Father. And let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul was taken to that third uh, heaven age, so to speak, and he was able to see it. And um, much was removed from him, but he still is able to express the change from the flesh age into the spiritual age with uh, great efficiency and correctness. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24, let's ask a word of wisdom. Just let your mind rest in the word and listen to it. 24, and it reads, Then cometh the end, that's the end of this dispensation to say the flesh age, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, now, this even goes to the end of the Lord's day, all right? This would be the last day of the millennium, I should say, when everything is delivered over to the Godhead. When he shall have put down all rule and authority and power, 25, for he must reign, a king reigns, a sovereign reigns, till he hath put all enemies under his feet. What is the main enemy? It's death, of course. And um, at the end of that millennium day, the Lord's day, when you say millennium, you're actually saying the Lord's day. For to the Lord, a thousand years is as, uh, is one day rather, is as a thousand years to man. So you can call it whatever you want to, but ultimately you come to the Lord's day when that's completed. Verse 26, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And naturally, that's a very specific death. It's certainly not the death of the flesh, but it is called the second death, which is to say death of souls. And we'll document that as we move along here. And if you have trouble with it, put it on the shelf. Don't sweat it. Actually, you would read in second, uh, chapter, the second chapter of Hebrews in verse 14 that Christ came to this earth, born of woman, whereby 
in being crucified and experiencing what we experience, plus being crucified, he was able, therefore, to destroy death, which is to say the devil. All right? So you kind of get it all wrapped up in one little nice um, saying there in that 14th verse of chapter 2, Hebrews 27. For he hath put all things under his feet, but when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, that's to say Yahweh, which did put all things under him. That's the way it's going to be. Like it or lump it, doesn't matter what your religion is, this is how it shall come to pass. 28. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then, I repeat, then, shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Now we're really saying a mouthful there, and uh, there is a great deal in that. I, I choose perhaps not to say a great deal about it other than that's when, at the last day of the millennium, then the full Godhead returns de facto to earth, uh, de jure, I should say, to be more correct legally. Uh, and here we have our Heavenly Father, the one we love so much, and it is for this reason that when you pray, you were instructed by the Son, always pray to the Father, but do it in His name, which simply gives credentials that you accepted the Son. So ultimately, on that last day of the millennium, there won't be anything wicked or evil left in this earth or in the heavens. It will have all been consumed by the consuming fire, and God is that consuming fire. We mentioned and referenced the book of Hebrews. Let's do it again. That's documented in Hebrews chapter 12, the very last verse. So we see that Christ returns at the second advent, begins that mill, that thousand years. And when that thousand years is complete, he turns the... Um, the throne, or perhaps that's an incorrect, I don't want to say that. He gives the authority back to the Father who accomplished the putting under. Okay, you got it? Now Paul continues, and he, he speaks here of you should be aware that we have two bodies. That we have this flesh body, but we also have a, um, a spiritual body. That's to say celestial and terrestrial. All right. That we have a flesh body, but also we have a spiritual body. Quite frankly, that spiritual body dwells within the flesh body. And when the flesh expires, you simply step out of it. It's that simple. To be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. You would find that in the second book Paul wrote to the Corinthians, chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. Now, in his, and he has described within this 15th chapter how those, that these bodies, one is spiritual and one is natural, that's to say fleshly. And then he comes down to that place of the millennium and tells us what it's going to be like when that happens. Let's pick it up, if we may, with verse 51 of this same chapter. Verse 51 reads, Behold, I show you a mystery. It shouldn't be a mystery to you, beloved. We shall not all sleep. Not all of us are going to die in a, in, in a natural way. You're going to be living when that last generation is. And, but we shall all, that's A-L-L, -L, that's, that's the good, bad, and the ugly. Everybody left at the seventh trump shall be changed. Now that doesn't mean they're going to heaven. Doesn't mean they're going to hell. They're going to be changed. The subject is the two bodies. You're going to be changed from one body to the other body. 
Now your poor little old soul is still going to be in the same condition it was before that change took place. You will have either overcome or you would have gone the other way. That is to say, not have succeeded. But all, every individual will be changed. Well, how long is that going to take? Verse 52, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. Now, don't ever let some yo-yo tell you that, well, you don't understand, brother, there is a series of trumps. In the Greek, there can only be one last. That's the farthest out, the ultimate. And if you've ever studied God's Word, you know that that's the seventh, all right? Stick with God's Word and turn yo-yos off. Wind their string and let them go, okay? Uh, it's, it's a very simple thing. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, that quick, at the last trump. Well, what happens at the last trump? That's when Christ returns, the true Christ. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Those that are, those that are um, in the flesh will put that flesh off in the twinkle of an eye, even the dead spiritually will be changed, as it is written. Now, he explains this in this wise. Verse 53, listen carefully, let your mind relax and absorb the Word of God. For this corruptible, what's corruptible? This flesh is. It's talking about our flesh body. In other words, the subject here is body. For this corruptible body must put on incorruption. The incorruption, of course, is the spiritual body. It must. And, and what, it, for, what for? For judgment, for the millennium. Everyone is going to change into a spiritual body, but don't ever think that gets you into heaven. It doesn't. It's simply giving you a sequence of events that must transpire. This corruptible body must put on the incorruptible body. That means, it means um, corruptible in the Greek means to with that able to wither, die, grow old. Well, incorruption cannot. Your spiritual body, that doesn't happen to it, all right? And then he continues on, and this mortal, mortal always applies to your soul. Now, there is a difference between your body and your soul. Your soul, uh, as you've heard me say many times, I think it's easier to teach if you understand it as self, regardless of what body you were in. In other words, your soul was with the Father when He placed it in the womb of your mother, and your soul is in the flesh body, and when the flesh body dies, your soul returns to the spiritual body. So this flesh body must put on the spiritual body and the mortal soul must put on immortality. That's deathlessness. Not all souls that are the, where the, spiritual, the body is changed to spiritual are immortal. Some of them are only mortal, meaning liable to die. That's what the word mortal means, liable to die. Why? If God judges them to hell. So naturally, if you're going to live the eternity, you must put on that immortality. Verse 54, so when this corruptible flesh body shall have put on incorruption, stepped out into the spiritual body, and this mortal soul, liable to die soul, shall have put on immortality, that is to say, have overcome through the blood of the Lamb, then, and I would say then only, shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. And so it is. 55, O death, where is thy sting? 
O grave, where is thy victory? It has none. The grave holds no one but ashes, dust. That's all the grave holds. To be absent from this body is present with the Lord, thus they are with him. 56. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. In other words, the law gives sin power, but at the same time, the law is good. It causes us to recognize it. 57. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You'd better never forget it, and you'd better always give thanks, because we couldn't find that perfection within ourselves. 58. To complete, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work, I repeat, the work of the Lord. For as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. There is no way that your labor can even be taken in vain in the Lord. When does death then destroy? We find that in the, the millennium chapters of that great book of Revelation. And we're going to go there. I want to just recap real briefly. There is a time at the end, as it was worded in the 24th verse of this chapter, that all things are going to be placed back under the authority of Almighty God. In other words, you're not going to have a king of this world. There's only going to be one king. And that's why we studied kingdom, whereby we could better understand the kingdom of God, the kingdom of the Son. Very interesting study. We've only scratched the surface but at least you have the formula in which to continue on your own. And always remember this, before you can have a kingdom, you must have a king. Therefore, when this thousand year reign begins, which is to say the millennium, what must happen? Revelation chapter 19, let's pick it up if we may with the 11th verse. And we find that 11th verse to read, and I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Peace? No. War? Yes. Who is this? Well, it's certainly not the white horse rider of Revelation 6. That was spurious Messiah, false Christ, come to deceive those that have not, learn, have not uh, learned from our Father's Word the chronolo chronological order of events. Verse 12, His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on His head were many crowns. There's a reason for that. And He had a name written, and no man knew but He Himself. 13, and he was clothed with a vesta dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. I don't know, have you ever read it? You hear, you hear it on this program every day, for Jesus Christ is the Word of God, therefore stay in it. That is his name, 14. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, uh, clothed in, the, in fine linen and white and clean. And of course, you would have learned back in the 8th verse of this that that linen is woven together from your righteous acts. If you don't have any, you're naked. I'm sorry, you won't be in this crowd. 15. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it, uh, should, uh, that with it he should smite the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the furiousness and wrath of Almighty God. And it is God's wrath that boils. Verse 16, know who he is? This is it. And he hath on his vesta and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. That, my friend, is our king. That, my friend, is the king of the kingdom, the kingdom that you should choose to dwell within. 
for there shall be no other. That's why all crowns of the world melted into one, and he is that king. Now, there is an exception to this in the eternal life, inasmuch as you would find in Revelation 21, verses 20 through 24, that the ethnos do have kings of their own that come to this king in the eternity. But we're in the millennium here. I don't want to confuse you. And that, 20th, that 19th chapter continues on. And at the second advent, when Christ returns, he takes the one world political system and the role of Antichrist and cast those into the lake of fire and they are destroyed, meaning that Satan will never again have the use of a political religious system to deceive the world. But he will still attempt to deceive. Why? Chapter 20, verse 1, the millennium begins. And I saw an angel come down from heaven having a, the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. The chain is literal, the angel is literal, and the pit is literal. Satan's going to be locked away. It will be as it is written in Isaiah 14. Is this the ish that deceived the world? Verse 2, And he laid hold on the dragon. Do you want to know who Satan is? Listen up. Satan plays many roles. Dragon, that old serpent, that's to say the old serpent from the garden. Don't some, let somebody hand you out snake food. His name is Satan. The same of the garden. He is the one that deceived the people in the garden, which is the devil and Satan, all his names, and bound him a thousand years, a millennium, that period of time. And that is actual. Now, Many people uh, take you back and they say, well, the serpent in the garden was a snake and he caused them to eat an apple. You won't find the word apple in the manuscripts, in the King James, and hopefully in none of the new translations. I don't waste my time with them because you've got a bunch of yo-yos that seem to have uh, higher critics that seem to enjoy deceiving and leading people astray from the originals. I know that that's not very flattering and I know that's why so many uh, of them love me and, and um, consider me their bosom buddy and all that and would like to be good friends, but I still keep myself set aside from them because they lie to the people and cause little children to lie to each other concerning snakes and apples which is so far away from the truth that it doesn't even, there's no stretch of the imagination. So I give them no quarter, no ledge, fall in, okay? Stick to the truth, which is the word of God, or, you know, you're not really serious. I know all of you are. That's why you enjoy studying. So that's his name, Serpent. It takes his, him from the dragon role that he played in the first earth age, the serpent in the garden, the beginning of this, and the various devices he used throughout this particular dispensation or plural of times. Three, and cast him, this angel took Satan, the old dragon, the snake serpent that is from the garden. He wasn't a snake, all right, forget it. It's Satan's name because he is a snake. Have you ever called somebody a snake? All right, well, that's what God called him. Three, and he cast him into the bottomless pit, that angel did. I have no doubt in my mind that will be Michael, all right? And shut him up. Don't ask me to document that. And shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more. Oh, man, never again. No, that's not what it said. No more till the thousand years should be fulfilled and after that, he must be loosed a little season. Why would God, once he had him chained up, let him go again? Because God will accept no one that is not tested. There are some people, because of the aforementioned people, the higher critics and, and teachers of lies, 
that there are some people that haven't got a prayer of a chance of overcoming because they have not been taught concerning the spurious Messiah that will appear first, and they're going to jump right in the sack with him thinking it's Christ. I know that's very plain, but that's exactly how it will come to happen when they're supposed to remain virgins until the seventh trump. They're not going to. But it isn't their fault. They will be taught through this thousand-year period. Why? Because our Father is fair. If He allows false teachers into the world, they in the spiritual body where there is none handicapped, no one that does not understand the Word of God, that has full use, 100% of their intellect, which is to say their spirit, within their soul, to make that choice whether they will love God or Satan. So that's why God will loose him again. After they've been taught, they've got to be tested. Let's see how it goes. Four, and I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls, again, the what? The souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. This was back in the Roman uh, Colosseums, the various uh, Christians that have uh, suffered death down through the years. You want to know where they are? You just read it. And for the word of God, and which had no, not worshipped the beast, that is to say, not been fooled by the that old serpent, into eating apples. Neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads, in their foreheads as it's written in the uh, 13th chapter, or in their hands, that means doing his work. They did not work for him. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. They actually reign with Christ through that entire millennium, doing what? Teaching. Teaching who? Those that did not have an opportunity, and don't you dare ever call the millennium a second chance, because many haven't got a prayer of a chance today with what they're being told, what they're being taught. Verse 5, But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. That's one you want to take part in, beloved, because to participate in the first resurrection is to not go through the millennium. You've already got it made. It's those that are written of in the Revelation chapter 6 that have already washed their robes and, and in the blood of the Lamb and overcome, have overcame. Well, what does this dead mean? Well, what did I tell you just a moment ago that mortal meant? Liable to die. And Check your manuscripts, and if you ever wanted to learn any Greek at all, this is where you need to put your mind to work and learn the difference between nikos and nikros. Because what it means is those that are still, that have an incorruptible body but still have a mortal soul liable to die, means they cannot change that condition until the second resurrection or the second death. One or the other, which will it be? That's final, all right? It's not talking about dead flesh, for at the time of this writing, there is no more flesh. It's talking about those that still have mortal souls. Well, what, are, what happened to them for that thousand years? Verse 6, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. That's to say, those that are not deceived by the spurious Messiah. On such the second death hath no power, not a chance. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. That's to say, they will teach. Teach who? These that are still spiritually dead for a thousand year period. And then they are tested when Satan is released a short period. The same as you that take part in the first resurrection are tested today. Verse 7. And when the thousand years are expired, that's to say this brings us to the end of the Lord's day, the millennium, 
Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Turn him loose, let him go. Coming out gate one. Verse eight and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. It would appear that Satan still has the ability to draw many of the heathen. That's what this Gog and Magog. Heathen simply means those that do not believe Yahweh Almighty God. Therefore, it, this is not the Gog and Magog written of in Ezekiel 38 and 39, which happens the last day of this dispensation before the millennium begins, known as Haman, Gog, and Ormagadon. Verse 9, And they went up, that's to say these, uh, these uh, misled ones, And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about, that's to say around God and His people. Do you want to know when Yahweh returns? Christ has already returned. Now Yahweh, listen. And the beloved city, what city is that? God's city, Jerusalem. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Why? God is a consuming fire. You better get that into your mind. It doesn't hurt you if you are with Him, but if you are against Him, He is a consuming fire. Do you know what the word consume means? Think about it. Verse 10, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, that's to say his one world political system and his role as spurious messiah, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Ezekiel chapter 28 verses 18 and 19 will tell you that means to be turned to ashes from within, consumed. Verse 11, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. That's to say the full Godhead is de facto, de jure, present. 12. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened. There is the book of life and the book of election, all right, which is the book of life and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works, not faith. We're at the end of the millennium. Come with me. If you haven't come with me, you're going to be lost, okay? That is to say, as far as understanding. Today, you will be judged in the first resurrection by your faith. How, how is your faith doing, friend? But after the first resurrection, then comes the millennium, and you are judged because you are in an incorruptible body, and Christ Himself is present along with the teachers of that time, where there's no faith involved in it. That's de facto. You're seeing Him. You're hearing Him. You don't play guessing games as that. My understanding this, or is this teacher teaching me correctly? You will know it's correct. Therefore, you're judged by works alone at the end of the millennium. Thus blessed are those that take part in the first resurrection. 13. And the sea, what is the sea? You would have learned in the 17th chapter that the sea is the peoples of the world. And the sea, our peoples of the world, gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, that's to say all the souls still spiritually dead, and they were judged every man according to their works. I don't know, that's one reason repentance, when John the Baptist cried, repent, that erases everything written on that line about you in a negative sense. The good stays. That's a reward. Verse 14, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This, 
listen to me, this is the second death, which is to say the death of the souls. That's the one you don't want to take part in. As it is written in um, uh, the, uh, I think it's the 10th chapter of the great book of, in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, it's written, Fear not he who can destroy your flesh body, but you'd better fear he who can cause your soul to perish with death. Just, I mean, to be fini, no more. That's forever and ever, my friend. Verse 15, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I don't know, how are you doing? Are you in it? What is the book of life? Well, the book is the book that has the names written in it that have eternal life. There is really only one life, and that is eternal life, for all other life will ultimately come to an end at its very temporal time. But eternal life is forever. And were you to go on uh, reading in that 21st chapter, you would find that no more is there anything that offends. Now some people would have you believe that here's the throne of God, the judge, there's the lake of fire. And old Uncle Benny is right there in the middle of that lake screaming and begging for a drop of water on his tongue, just in miserable pain, just frying him alive. And we're, we're enjoying all this, and it's heaven. Hmm? Does that sound right to you? I mean, that's what preachers say, you know. But it shows how little they know of God's Word. There is not one thing left that offends. I don't know about you, but it would offend me to forever in my happiness see Uncle Benny frying, you know? Well done. You know, I, I don't think I could call that heaven. And I think that probably in a period of time, most people would get pretty tired of that. Now, number one, flesh won't, uh, after you leave the flesh body, a spiritual body won't burn with fire you know as fire today. But our God has a consuming, is a consuming fire. He spoke and nothing became everything. He spoke and He created man for His pleasure. He can also speak and, sorry, that's the second death. Now, I know that there are not too many that stand with me in that, and I've never take, taken a great deal of time to worry about who stood and who did not stand with me as long as I study independently in my Father's Word and in the Masra, in the manuscripts, and come to a conclusion that all of God's Word is common sense, for our Father is supernatural, meaning more natural than we are. By natural, I mean He has a natural set of laws, gravity, so on and so forth, and that doesn't get changed, friend. So that's the millennium. Now, better than this, you could turn to, easy if we were to continue this study, and I have no intentions of doing it separately from what that time we will study in the great book of Ezekiel, from chapter 40 to chapter 48. All those chapters pertain to the millennium, the Lord's Day. You have that full set of chapters long chapters, basically, that tell you in the Old Testament exactly what's going to happen in the millennium. Uh, it's, it's one of the best studies that a person can make. You will find, and I can summarize it for you real briefly, you will find that the millennium temple is began in that 40th chapter, and it's one-seventh larger in all dimensions than Solomon's temple was. Why? Seven is spiritual completeness, and 7,000 God's election not bowing a knee to Baal, as it is written in Romans chapter 11, verse uh, 4, 3 and 4. How perfect and how wonderful our Father is that He would give everyone the handicap, 
those that are slow to think, that opportunity, and I'm not saying that many of them haven't already overcome, but I'm saying He is a fair God and He is just. Don't ever accuse me of saying the millennium, that thousand year period which is called the Lord's Day, is a time of second chances. It is not. For what is taught today, many people haven't got a prayer of a chance to overcome with the deception that is ripe and is ready to be plucked, even at this time, to take us into the first tribulation. Unfortunately, I'm sorry, very few teach you that there are two tribulations which are written of in Mark chapter 13, Matthew 24. That first tribulation is Antichrist. Before you even get to God's tribulation, you don't have to worry about the tribulation of Antichrist because you're not going to be fooled by it. You don't have to worry about God's tribulation because He's not angry at you. So don't accuse me of second chance. There is no second chance for those that know better. But there is that time of teaching that all things are made right and equal and then they are tested. And then comes the second death. I really look forward to that time of the second death. That may sound strange, but that's when it will be written, death is destroyed. Grave, where is your victory? For our Father and His Son will have overcome all these things. So there you have the kingdom and the millennium. To have a kingdom, you must have a king. And his is the Lord of Lords, and the millennium is known as the Lord's Day. I hope you enjoyed it. Bless your hearts. I heard you say, we will meet our family in heaven. What chapter and verse will this be in? Well, it, um, you will find it in the millennium chapters we were just studying about. Ezekiel chapter 44, verse 25 stipulates that if you are Zadok, that means just, one of the elect, and overcome, you will be able to go to your relatives and help them. You would have to know who they were, recognize them, or you wouldn't uh, be able to help them anyway. Gerald from Kentucky. I own a lot of land and I sell it to people who can't get a loan for nothing down and only charge 10% interest. Today I read that we are not to charge interest and I don't know what to do. I've studied with you quite a while now. I wish you'd clear this up for me. Don't charge your brother interest, okay? Don't charge your brother, the one born of the same womb you are. Usury is uh, not good, but, uh, you know, it's um, also, um, we have to go into it at times and use it to your advantage. No problem, all right? Just don't charge your brother, blood brother, interest. Shirley from Florida. Is there a place in the Bible that says when and if black people's skin was changed? Absolutely not. God created the uh, black race the way He wanted it. He likes it as it is written after He created all the races, the black, the brown, and so forth, uh, and, and yellow. Then the last verse of chapter 1 in the book of Genesis says, and he looked and it was good. He was pleased with it. And that's the way he wanted it. That's the way he created it. And that's the way he wants it to stay. All right. He loves all of his children. And um, uh, Gladys from Tennessee, Ezekiel 44, 25. Well, now see, now there is the exact, um, there's the exact chapter and verse I forementioned about knowing your folks. Will there be sickness and dying in the millennium? Uh, no. I have to be careful about saying there will be no dying because there will be the second death at the end, but not during. Okay, got it? Um, Judy from Minnesota. I heard a local Christian radio station say that you didn't believe in the Trinity. You know, 
Judy, you've listened to me teach this hour. How many times have you heard me say the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit? How many times have you heard me say Yahweh the Father, Yeshua or Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit? How many times? And you would believe some liar? Come on. Don't listen to junk, all right? Hear with your own ears. Would you believe what some radio preacher said? They also said that you elaborate on the elect and that people who study with you tend to get on an ego trip and think that they are little gods. Please comment. That's a lie. Little gods? That's idolatry. That is a blatant, ball face lie. Uh, whoever said this, I don't know who it was, but I have never taught anyone other than that they were God's children. There's only one God, and that is our Father. Don't ever call God's election. And how many times have you heard me say, just because you are one of the elect, it simply means, as it is written in Ephesians 1, 4, that you were chosen before the foundation of the earth, that that makes you any better than anyone else. Or, as far as an ego trip and putting people on it, how many of you have ever heard me take, this is to say myself, take credit for the gift of teaching. It's God's gift. God forbid that the truth would put anyone on an ego trip. I, you know, these radio people that say this lie about someone that is successful and God is blessing because they are against Christians or anti-Christian. All they can do is try to tear something up that is successful, but don't worry, God will destroy them. Um, it is strange how people can, can lie to some of the people, but not all the people. I hope that people that listen to me teach, I've taught for 40 years, I've never taken a salary. I am, I've um, uh, never driven fancy cars to like be an ego, own a, an ego. I don't have gold-plated, glass-plated churches or anything like that to get on an ego trip. Uh, you see, these people just like to lie, and they are liars, and God will correct them, all right? And it's not going to be too long until they are. Incidentally, I would like to say at this time, we are trying to contact uh, several of the attorneys licensed and now practicing in California that study with me whereby they know what I teach for a fact and understand terms such as Kenite and a few other things. We're trying uh, at this time to contact as many that study with me and understand the terminologies that are used for we may need you in California in the very near future. We would like for you to touch base and we're not asking for volunteer time, but um, um, a practicing law firm and or attorney in California. Uh, we're gonna put a stop to some of these lies, all right? Make them toe the line. Bonnie from Wisconsin. You said that the spirit and soul go to heaven. This cannot be true because the Bible says that only the spirit returns to God. Please back up your statement with scripture. Well, Bonnie dear, uh, what do you think Jesus, when he was talking about two actual men in a parable of Lazarus and the rich man, um, what do you think it was that was talking in that part of the rich man that was... Um, you think it was just his spirit? He was burning sugar. I mean, I mean, the man was hurting. He was crying out, and even in the spiritual body, for water, which is truth when translated properly. You think it was only his spirit there? Of course not. And though I'm sure you're pulling from Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7, what do you think the spirit is? Why, why would you... Why would you uh, uh, separate that from the truth? The spirit is the intellect of the soul and thus is part of the soul. All right? You can't separate them. God doesn't separate them. He separates bodies, but not the spirit and soul. 
Uh, Kelly from Michigan, according to Deuteronomy 22.5, women should not wear that which pertains to a man. Does this mean that I should not wear pants or jeans? If I do, will this make me less of a Christian and will I go to hell? No, absolutely not. All right. When Deuteronomy 22.5 was written, men wore skirts. All right. They didn't wear breeches. They wore skirts. That's why they were instructed, gird them up because they couldn't hardly run and fight with their skirt showing, all right? No, it means that a woman should never take the place of a man sexually, as it is written in Romans chapter 1. Um, you know, women's pantsuits are not men's clothing. I've seen a few of those preachers that would preach that they were, they might fit them pretty good from their shape and form, and certainly their mind. There's nothing wrong with a woman wearing uh, pantsuits uh, or whatever, biblically speaking. Custom, well, be that as it may. Um, Debbie from California, you have talked about standing up as warriors and kill our enemies, but I thought we were to love our enemies. I do not understand this. Well, sugar, if you had been in Korea and you had, if you were about 12,000 Marines and there were 120,000 Chinese coming down the ridge at you, you know, yelling, kill, die, Marines, would you love them? Take them unto your bosom? And the hot lead is flying, not lead, but brass. You would love them, sugar? I think not. To love a child, what do you do, Debbie? You correct it. God said you will chastise it if you love it. Well, you have to chastise your enemy too. And if they try to take over your country whereby you cannot practice your God-given rights, you have to kill them. That's the only chastisement that is afforded you. All right? So, you do it God's way. Christ is returning with a rod to square people away and fire. And yes, he loves his enemies. He loves to put them where they belong in the lake of fire if necessary, all right? Grow up. Uh, Irene from Canada, what are the names that you use to keep Satan out of your home or mind? The power of Jesus, all right, will do. But I use Yeshua, the Father Yahweh, and I take charge, order them out, anything negative, back where it came from. Use the oil of our people on the doorpost and order them away. Cantrell from Tennessee. I just heard you say that God had a wife and he divorced her because he was tired of her. No, you didn't hear me say that, okay? But I, I, where is this at in the Bible? No, God got tired of her sinning, all right? It, it is symbolically put forth in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 8, all right? Bill from Pennsylvania, Ezekiel 18, 4 reads, Behold, all souls are mine as the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. But the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Please explain this. Um, well, I think you, the soul that sins is going to die in the second death. That explains it. Thanks for the Holy Spirit touching you that this, oh, I forgot. That radio guy said I didn't believe in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> oh, there we go again. Just trumped up their little game and just disappoint their little old hearts. Uh, sorry about that. I'm not sorry about it. I'm... <laughs> I just like to burn them occasionally because they're going to burn a long time, okay? Ezekiel 18.4 reads exactly that way, and the second death is when it takes place, okay? Uh, Leah from Illinois. If I may, I have a question. Um, Father said in Malachi the, that he will send Elijah to turn the hearts of the children back to the fathers. Will we know it's Elijah? Will he say, I'm Elijah? Or is it something we have to discern individually? Well, either way, when he comes, we, won't, we will know, all right? You will know when your heart is turned back to the true father, or away from the false father, Antichrist, then you will know, all right? Uh, Elijah, uh, that is a promise in that Malachi 4th chapter, and God will send him. Okay, I'm out of time. I love you all a lot, and I'm glad that we covered this kingdom and millennium.
What a fantastic subject. Again, we could have spent a lot more time, but our, our Father, the main thing, our Father loves you for having studied His Word. He really does. It makes His day. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, but most important of all, this, you stay in His Word. Every day in His Word is a good day. Do you know why? Of course you do, because Jesus is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life.